Okay, we're going to look at kinematics where we're describing motion. And the first thing that we talk about when describing kinematics, of course, is position and our change in position. Uh, change in position, we're also going to call displacement. But let's talk about the units associated with um, distance and change in distance. So again, um, you're probably used to the old U.S. customary system, the British system of inches, feet, yards, and miles. But in terms of uh, kinematics, we like to use SI units. Uh, even in the British system, they're obscure units such as furlongs. All of these units were developed at a time where we didn't have to be all that precise. Now with science, we embrace the metric units because we can reach a very high precision of, of calibration. And it's also easy to convert smaller quantities to larger quantities and larger quantities to smaller quantities. Um, in terms of length, in terms of distance, one of the smallest units in the metric system is the femtometer, also known as the Fermi. This is about the size of an atomic nucleus. Going larger than that, the nanometer is on about the same size, maybe a little bit smaller uh, than the atom. You might have heard the term nanomachine or nanotechnology. It's referring to technology close to this size. Normally an atom is about 10 to the minus 10, whereas a nanometer is 10 to the minus 12. So actually what they're talking about are hundreds of nanometers. The micrometer, or the micron, is on the scale of the bacteria. And if you go into tens of microns, you know, you're talking about maybe the scale of, of organelles and cells. The millimeter, obviously, we're starting to get into the realm where it's very easy for our eye to see. The centimeter, very common unit, used alternatively uh, in place of the inch when, when people use the metric system. Um, and the meter. The meter is the SI unit for distance. All those other units are going to be based on the meter. And the meter, of course, is based on the distance that light travels in one 299 millionths, 792 thousandths, 450 eighths of a second. All of the metric units of distance are derived from the standard meter. So while the meter is the SI unit for length, um, all those other metric units, uh, part of the metric system, the meter would be a subset of that. Converting meters, um, you're probably aware that a meter is roughly about a yard. Converting meters into miles is roughly about 1,600 miles in a meter. Um, meters about 3.25 feet, or about 39 inches. Going to larger scales, a kilometer is 1,000 meters, a um, little bit smaller of a unit than a mile. But again, any time that we're describing uh, distances of length, we're typically going to stick to the meter in this course because that is an SI unit, and we like the MKS units. So again, distance, um, the length something has, the space in between two points, um, displacement could be the change of position, all of these are measured in meters. If we want to know how quickly our position changes as a function of time, the rate of change in position is known as speed. Speed is distance divided by time, usually it's written as V for speed, because V is uh, the um, variable that we use for velocity, and speed is the magnitude for velocity. So speed is equal to the change in distance, or the change in position, divided by the change in time. X is oftentimes used as our position, especially when we're talking about one-dimensional motion, it's just used there generally. So if we have units of distance in meters, and we divide that by time, the SI unit for time is seconds, we have uh, meters per second as our unit. Again, uh, use customary units. Normally, we're used to miles per hour, feet per second. Um, you know, basically, uh, we use miles per hour on our speed on our roadways to measure the distances in, uh, I should say, the speed of pitches in, in baseball and softball. Uh, but other than that, getting into any of the scientific measurements we would probably uh, go to meters per second because that's the easier unit to handle. 
It's also the, the unit that's used throughout uh, the world most commonly. Uh, in fact, if you look at the metrics, uh, I'm sorry, the metric system in the Olympics, um, you know, most of the world uses the metric system, so it naturally uh, is used in, in Olympic sports. Um, any of the track events, the 100-meter dash, the 200-meter dash, the 400-meter dash, and so on, are all based on SI units of length. So again, SI units for speed, or the meter per second, it's a slightly larger unit than the mile per hour. Roughly, sometimes you can convert from one to the other by a factor of two. Wherever your miles per hour are, you can approximate meters per second by cutting that number in half. Wherever your meters per second are, if you double that, that gives you miles per hour. So the conversion here, 55 miles per hour, which is a common speed limit, if we divide that by 2.23 miles per hour, we're dividing miles per hour by miles per hour to get rid of it, for every meter per second, we get back roughly 25 meters per second. Okay? You know, not quite a, a two to one um, ratio between the two. You know, slightly more than twice 25. Okay, but again, it gives you a pretty good approximation. 10 meters per second. Multiply that by the conversion factor instead of dividing. We get 22 miles per hour. So again, you can see, you know, approximately a factor of two. More precisely, a factor of 2.23. So again. We write our equation for speed. We use this term delta to indicate change. Okay? X again, if we're on a number line, you know that X is the position on the end number line. So we can imagine that that X is some position. Delta, meaning change, the change in position, okay, how much we move compared to the change in time, distance divided by time, that gives us our speed. And again, we don't use a symbol S normally. We use a symbol V. Because vectors, as we're going to see later on, are written with an arrow on top. Their magnitude is written without the arrow on top. So speed is actually velocity without direction. So speed, you just got to get used to the variable v. All right, let's do a quick calculation. Let's consider a person who runs the 400 meter. They're able to do this in one minute. How fast did this person run? Okay, what was their average speed? Well, speed is distance divided by time. The race was done in 400 meters, and this runner completed in one minute. We want SI units, so I'm going to convert that to seconds. 60 seconds, so they're running at a rate of 6.7 meters per second. You want to convert this to miles per hour. Again, we're going from a larger unit to a smaller unit. Meters per second are, are bigger than miles per hour. So we multiply by our conversion factor, and we get about 15 miles per hour, and that's a pretty good clip. That's a really good runner, running that race. What about if you want to calculate distance? Let's play with a little algebra right here. V is equal to delta x over t. If we take the delta t and multiply it to both sides, we leave delta x by itself. Delta t divided by delta t cancels out we get that the distance is equal to the velocity times the change in time. So if a person runs at a rate of 5 meters per second, that's your V, and they do so for 180 seconds, 3 minutes, okay, we multiply the two together, and we see that they go 900 meters. All right? You can convert this to kilometers. You can convert this to miles. Again, just multiply or divide by the appropriate conversion factor. What about calculating the time? What if I want to know how long it takes to go some distance traveling at a given speed? Again, a little bit of algebra here. Multiply delta t to both sides, divide v from both sides, and we get a new equation. The time it takes to go some distance, okay, is the distance divided by the velocity. Consider a person who drives 120 kilometers at a speed of 90 kilometers per hour. How long will it take to travel this distance, okay? 120 kilometers, we're not using SI units now. We're still in metric though. 120 divided by 90 kilometers per hour. The kilometers cancel out and we're left with one over one over hours. It takes them 1.5 hours. So here's our equation for time, velocity, and distance. Um, 
Here's our equation for distance, given velocity and time, and of course, our equation for velocity, given distance and time. Now, again, in the Olympics, we always um, used fixed distances and time how long it takes to go down there to see who's the fastest. And probably the best race to uh, determine uh, speed is the 100 meter dash. Okay? Um, here is uh, the 100 meter dash run in, in 2007, so this is quite a while back. I know, you've seen Bolt holds the record. This is a South of Powell. He ran 100 meters in 9.74 seconds. It's a real easy calculation to do. What was his average speed? 100 divided by 9.74 gives you 10.2 meters per second. So anybody who can run the 100 meter in 10 seconds or less is a world-class sprinter. That is world-class speed. And you'll rarely see, except for at the very top levels, such a fast time. Because we're taking distance and dividing it by time, the shorter the time, the faster the race. Makes sense. Of course, um, Usain Bolt broke this record in, in um, 2008, ran the 100 meters in 9.683 seconds, and then broke it even further, or set an even new record, at 9.58 seconds in 2009. So that currently is the fastest time that anybody's ever run this. I haven't updated it. I know there are a few other uh, you know, fast times in there. But um, again, if you think about the equation, velocity is distance divided by time. The faster you can make the time, the faster that you're traveling. And here are some different uh, records that have been set throughout the years. I apologize, I think it only goes up to 2011, so there are some faster times in here. But I think the 2009 uh, record remains the, uh, the fastest. Fastest uh, woman still holds from 1988. This is Florence Griffith Joyner, who actually passed away, uh, which is incredible. She passed away from asthma, uh, but yet she was still able to uh, run the fastest 100 meter nearly at a second, uh, and that women's record still holds today. And again, here's some other records that have been set. Again, it looks like this goes also up to 2011. You can see that 1988 record still holds by a considerable amount. What we've been talking about is fastest average speed. We're averaging over an entire trip, some distance, and some time. It's a little bit different from instantaneous speed. Think about it this way. You're traveling somewhere and your speedometer will vary depending on what kind of road conditions you're in, what the speed limit is locally. Sometimes when you're in the city, you're going slower. Sometimes when you're on the highway, you're going faster. But your average speed will always be how far did you go and how long did it take? Instantaneous speed says what's happening at this very moment. So even though uh, approximately 10 meters per second, just a little under 11 meters per second, is the fastest average speed anybody's run the 100 meter, unofficial records have been kept using radar guns and the fastest speeds clocked were about 26 miles per hour or almost 12 meters per second. So that's really, really impressive. And these were held by Murray Screen and Donovan Bailey. And again, we can see your speed can vary over the entire trip. It's really the average speed that talks about, well, how far did you go? How long? Human beings aren't really that fast. Certainly the world-class sprinters are um, elite among humans. But if we compare them to, um, let's say, racehorses or other animals, uh, we don't do so well. Secretariat ran the Kentucky Derby and holds the record for one and a quarter miles in one minute, 59.4 seconds. That's an average speed of 38 miles per hour, or 17 meters per second. Now, remember, this horse is running over a mile and keeping that speed fairly constant throughout the trip. So, you know, the 100 meter times seem fast until we compare them to racehorses. The fastest uh, racehorse actually ran a sprint, which is a shorter race, and they reached about 40 miles per hour, or about 
18 meters per second. So horses are about twice as fast as humans. Again, you know, humans can reach 26 miles per hour for a very brief amount of time, but honestly, you know, horse is going to go about twice as fast for the same given distance. Of course, there are other animals out there. Falcon can dive. Now that's sort of artificial because they're using gravity to obtain this at about 217 miles per hour, about 100 meters per second. Fastest land animal is the cheetah at 64.3 miles per hour, or about 29 meters per second. And uh, ostriches, flightless birds, you think, well, you know, wouldn't they be more formidable if they could fly? Well, if you can run at 45 miles per hour, um, you don't necessarily need to fly. They can pretty much outrun uh, most of their competition, most of their, their prey that's after them. Um, they're actually very dangerous birds, by the way. They can kill you with their legs. Their legs are so strong. They can propel them up to 45 miles per hour. They're going to be quite formidable. Tropical storms. We rate tropical storms according to their speed. Um, we also rate them according to the pressure, but category 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are rated by how fast their central wind speeds are. Category 1 hurricane, 75 miles per hour, that's about 34 meters per second. The most intense hurricanes are over 70 meters per second. And what we notice is there's only a doubling in the wind speed from category 1 to category 5. It's important to note that it's not the speed of the wind that's so destructive, it's the energy. The kinetic energy alone from the wind speed actually increases by a factor of four as you go from a category one to a category five. Other interesting speeds, the fastest commercial, uh, well, passenger jets go about 266 meters per second. Uh, speed of sound is about 340 meters per second. At colder temperatures, about 300. 35 meters per second. The SR-71 spy plane reached nearly a thousand meters per second. And the experimental plane, the unpiloted X-53A, uh, reached up to almost Mach 10 at over 3,000 meters per second. That's slow when you compare it to different things in our universe. Our moon goes about a thousand meters per second around the Earth. The Earth goes about 30,000 meters per second around the Sun. Mercury goes even faster. Our solar system is moving around the center of the galaxy at about uh, 210 meters per second. And our galaxy is headed for a collision with the Andromeda galaxy at nearly 450,000 meters per second. So as you get to larger and larger scales, you notice that the relative velocities also tend to increase. Light, of course, is the fastest speed. In glass, it travels a little bit lower, slower, as it does through water, but 300 million meters per second is the fastest that anything can travel. And if we talk about relativity, we'll see that as we approach this speed, um, space and time actually become distorted. Okay, let's talk about graphing distance and time. If we graph distance and time, and I apologize for the typo right here, Distance is a function of time. If we're moving at a constant rate, we get a straight line. The steeper that slope of that line, the faster we're traveling. It means that we have more rise than run. We are going a greater distance for a smaller amount of time. A smaller displacement over a longer time indicates a slower speed. So in a graphing position versus time, or distance versus time, we can tell how fast we're going from the slope. In this case, I went 60 meters in 4 seconds. Slope is rise over run. Velocity is displacement over time, 15 meters per second. Obviously, I can't run that fast, but maybe I'm traveling in a vehicle to get that. Likewise, at a slower speed, here I only go 30 meters in 12 seconds. Rise over run, distance over time, now we're down to 2.5 meters per second. I think I can still run that fast. If our speed is changing, we will see a difference in the slope. Okay? Here I have a positive slope, so I'm moving with some velocity. When the slope goes flat, when there is no slope, 
we're stationary. We're not changing our distance, so therefore we're not moving. So, zero slope indicates that the object is stationary. When it starts moving again, we see the slope go uphill. If it's going in the opposite direction, the slope goes down. Here's what it looks like if we don't have a constant speed. In this case, this graph is getting steeper and steeper and steeper. Okay? That means that the speed is getting faster and faster. Okay? So if I had a graph, distance is a function of time. For an object speeding up, it might look something like this. If I'm graphing something that where the object is slowing down, the slope will start out high and then go lower. So how steep that slope is, that tells you how fast you're going when distance is graphed versus time. Let's look at the Falcon Heavy. SpaceX has had a lot of success putting satellites in orbit. This is the SpaceX's largest rocket that is operational right now. It's actually three rockets, uh, boosters, strapped together, and it's known as Falcon 9 Heavy. We can look at the position as a function of time for this rocket because they keep track of all these parameters during spaceflight. And what it looks like as it goes upward, it'll start with a fairly upward trajectory, and then as it continues its flight, it will actually level off, and most of the velocity will be parallel to the surface of the Earth. As soon as it gets going about 20 times the speed of sound, it can reach orbit. Now you'll see a few important events here. BECO stands for Booster Engine Cutoff. The boosters will turn off and separate. MECO means Main Engine Cutoff. The main engine cuts off and then it separates and the second stage ignites and it continues. So, what does it look like on a Falcon 9 Heavy trip? Again, it starts upward so it doesn't really cover very much horizontal distance initially. Then as it becomes more and more um, level over ground, you will see the slope getting greater and greater as it's picking up more and more speed. So what we see here is that this rocket is continuously going faster during its journey. Now, let's get back to the idea of, I brought up velocity before. I said velocity was a vector. A vector is any quantity that has both a numeric value, it's going to have units too, and a direction. We've been talking about speed. Speed has no direction. Speed just says, how fast are you going? A vector like velocity asks how fast and in what direction. Now vector quantities, again, they're going to have a number associated with them and they're going to have a direction. And we represent the number value by the length of an arrow and the direction by the direction that the arrow points. So when we draw vectors on a diagram, their length indicates, well, how much are they? The direction that the arrow points indicates what direction is this. If this were velocity, the object's heading off in this direction. Again, a vector is distinguished from a scalar by a little arrow on top. So, for instance, if I were talking about velocity, I would have a V with an arrow on top to indicate that it's a vector. It asks how fast and in what direction, as opposed to speed, which would not have the arrow. Okay, displacement. Displacement is a vector. It tells you um, how much your position changes from where you started to where you go. So, for instance, if I were to go from a campsite to a lake, my displacement would indicate how much my position has changed from campsite to lake. It wouldn't worry about how I went there. It would only be concerned about what was my old position, what was my new position. The difference between the two would be represented by that vector. Now velocity, again, is a vector. It has a quantity associated with the length of the arrow that represents it, and it has a direction. So velocity to speed, velocity is displacement, okay, how much my position has changed, what direction has changed, divided by time. So speed is distance divided by time, velocity is displacement divided by time. Here, 
are a number of uh, vector maps showing different velocities of wind speeds at different altitudes. But other vectors might include force, acceleration, electric field, and momentum. Scalars, their time, mass, energy, they have no direction to them. Again, if we want to represent a vector, we normally scale it. We say, this vector, okay, let's say it represents 12 kilometers. I draw it on a piece of paper, I want to scale it so that that scale represents physically what's going on. So maybe one centimeter will equal a kilometer. Any two vectors are said to be equal if they point in the same direction and they're equal in magnitude. It doesn't matter where they are. Those two vectors are equal as long as they have the same direction and the same magnitude. We say vectors are opposite, and we use a negative sign, if they're equal in magnitude, they're both as long as one another, but they point 180 degrees in different directions. So A points here, negative A would point in the opposite direction. We can add vectors. That'll be really important for when we talk about forces. We add forces together. But for now, most of the vectors we, choose, we deal with don't involve addition. If you want to add vectors, you can do it geometrically on a graph paper, keeping everything to scale, using a protractor to get the right uh, direction, or algebraic methods where you can add different perpendicular components. We don't deal with a lot of vectors in this course. Most of that is left for uh, the Physics 130 and the Physics 131. But again, to add two vectors, we take the first vector, attach the second vector to that, and the addition of two vectors, notice we don't get you know, a length equal to A plus B, we get a length slightly smaller than that. We call the addition of two vectors the resultant. And there are different methods that we can use. It doesn't matter if you do A first then B, B first then A. It's a commutative property. The order of the vectors doesn't really matter. If we want to add many vectors together, again, we use the same head-to-tail method. One vector takes us here, we add another vector to that, then another vector, then another vector, and R becomes the resultant of four different vectors added together. Vector subtraction is just subtracting off the opposite of a vector. This is A minus B, which is the same as A plus negative B. Works the same way with addition and subtraction with scalars. We can also multiply vectors by scalars. Here, we've taken the number 3 and multiplied it by the vector a. What does that do to a? Simply makes a three times longer. It changes the magnitude, but it doesn't change the direction when we multiply by a positive scalar. What if we take a negative scalar and multiply by it? Well, what that does is it changes the length, but it turns the vector 180 degrees around. So scalars can change the direction, but they're just going to change the direction to the opposite direction. Okay, so again, speed, it's a scalar. Units are meters per second. Velocity vector, same units. Speed, symbol is normally V. Velocity, symbol is normally V with an arrow on top. Um, speed talks about how fast. Velocity is also about how fast, but the difference here, no direction for speed. If it's a velocity, it's telling you where it's going. Now with acceleration. Acceleration is the change in velocity, not the change in speed, the change in velocity divided by the time. The equation for acceleration is quite simple. I've left out the arrows here because we're going to do, deal mainly with just the magnitudes here. It's delta V, change in velocity, divided by change in time. There are two types of accelerations, or two accelerations that we can, we can break it down to. The acceleration in the direction of travel we call tangential acceleration. If we were to draw a path that something was following, the tangent line would be in the direction that it is at that very moment. Okay. So with tangential acceleration, the change in velocity results in a speeding up or a slowing down. Okay? When you speed up, your tangential acceleration is in the same direction as your velocity. 
when you're slowing down the tangential acceleration points in the opposite direction. 